Hey friends, it's Tomer, and in this video, we're going to be ranking every single Commander pre-constructed deck that came out in this year, 2023. There was a whopping 25 Commander decks printed this year, which can be very overwhelming if you're just trying to find one or two pre-cons that best work for you. I'm going to be ranking every single pre-con based on three criteria. First is the stock list, how good the deck is right out of the box without any modifications. The second criteria is upgrade potential, how powerful can this deck become if you start upgrading it with other cards? And then the final category is uniqueness. Is it a similar archetype that we've seen before done in a commander pre-constructed deck? Is the art unique? All that sort of stuff in the uniqueness category. Each category will be ranked from D all the way to S, where D is just one point, and then you get one more point all the way up to S, which is five points. And then I just add up all the numbers and put the pre-con on this tier list. I'm also going to cover the price of each pre-con and the most expensive cards in each one, but I'm not going to include them in the ranking because oftentimes the total value of the pre-constructed deck is going to be mirrored in the actual price that you're going to be paying for when you buy it at your store or Amazon or our sponsor, cardgame.com slash mtggoldfish. So it's not like there is an MSRP anymore where you can get these all for $50 and if there's a deck that's worth $100 you're going to still pay for $50. No, most likely you're going to be spending $100 for your $100 value deck. But it's good to know if there are very expensive pre-cons out there and you find a really good deal for them, maybe they're worth picking up. All right, we kick things off with the first pre-cons printed this year with Rebellion Rising. This is a Boros Tokens combat deck. All it wants to be doing is attacking and making tokens and attacking with those tokens. Rebellion Rising has two potential commanders, Nayali Sun's Vanguard and Uthari Sun's Glory. Uthari plays more of like a Voltron token generator. It's like go wide Voltron. It's a very unique strategy. Whereas Nayali is more fitting for the stock list where it just promotes go wide attacking. Uh, giving all your tokens double strike means double the damage output and then also generates a lot of card advantage because you get to impulse draw when you're attacking with tokens. Uh, both are very, very powerful. I think Niali is more uh, standardized, strong, and a better leader for the list. That's why she's a face commander, whereas Othari requires a lot more uh, swapping and upgrades in the stock list for it to be a better uh, commander. In terms of deck price, uh, the price is currently $57, according to MTG Goldfish, with the most notable cards being Clever Concealment, which is a new staple, in my opinion, uh, in Commander, Floss Maneuver, which is another staple for protection for your board, Staff of the Storyteller actually sees Legacy play and whatnot, it's very, very powerful, and then Boros Charm is another way to just mass protect your entire board very efficiently, and also deal uh, lethal damage by giving something Double Strike, or just dealing four damage to kill somebody. The stock list is quite good. Uh, the deck focuses on token generators and cards that care about tokens. So I count 31 token generators in the deck and 23 cards that care about tokens. Uh, the reprints are pretty good overall. Uh, there's some good new cards. Uh, but there's a lot of fluff in this deck, mediocre cards that kind of weigh down uh, the deck overall to make it like, to stop it from being like super good. However, the commanders are incredibly powerful. Uh, a lot of the cards in the 99 are very good. So overall, I'm going to give the stock list an A. Now the deck really shines if you start upgrading it. Uh, combat and token generators are heavily supported in Boros colors. White has a ton of amazing token generators. Red is all about combat and extra combats and combat triggers and all that stuff. So you have a lot to work with. So stuff like Cathar's Crusade is one of the best anthems in the entire game. Battle Angels of Tear makes tokens. It doesn't work very well with Niali, but it still has token matters and gives all uh, Niali gives them all double strike is very, very good. And then when you start adding red, you get extra combat steps with Breath of Fury, which is just almost near infinite in the deck if you add it. Uh, Commander Liara Portier just is insane card advantage in the deck. So there's a ton of potential once you start adding these big powerhouse cards. So I'm gonna give the upgrade potential of the deck also an A. In terms of uniqueness though, I'm gonna actually uh, ding it here and I'm gonna give it a C. Uh, we've seen plenty of token strategies, combat token strategies in previous Commander decks. So it's nothing new, even though there is a slight like equipment sub theme to it. 
sense with this new four Mirrodin mechanic. Overall, it's just a go wide token combat deck that we've seen a thousand times in Boros. I know a lot of people don't care about unique decks. You just want to pick up the pre-con that works best for you. But this is something to keep in mind if you are collecting pre-cons or anything like that. Uh, if you want to have unique pre-cons, then this one is going to overlap with a lot of previous pre-cons. So with Rebellion Rising at 10 points, I'm going to give it a solid B. The next deck is Corrupting Influence. This is the first ever Poison Precon ever printed. It's very exciting to me personally, but we'll see how it goes in the ranking. This is Abs and Poison, so we're basically just trying to poison out our opponents. Once they take 10 Poison Counters, they just immediately die. So the two commanders available for this deck is Ixil Sion of Atraxa, which is a nice and steady uh, toxic commander it has evasion flying a big butt so it can block very well it can easily start spreading poison counters from the air and it generates card advantage once your opponents are corrupted whereas Vishgraz is more kind of like a go wide ish voltron version of this it only has toxic one but it gets really really big and it puts a lot of mites onto the battlefield so it has the potential of putting a lot more uh, poison counters on each of your opponents uh so it just does more damage it has menace which is nice too uh it gets really really big uh, but Ixil is just the slow and steady consistent uh, poison generator plus uh, card advantage. So I just think in the stock list, Ixil is just way better. I think Ixil is quite strong, uh, not like overwhelmingly strong and weaker than let's say Niali at go wide tokens. Uh, but she's very reliable, uh, very nice source of card advantage. And Vishgraz uh, is better once you start building uh, a deck around it, not just the stock list. For deck price, it's currently $64. Uh, the most notable card in the deck is Glistening Sphere, which is just a new mana rock that proliferates. So it works very well in poison decks, but also works in any sort of counter decks. Uh, Noxious Revival is quite good. Chromatic Lantern, Ghostly Prison. Uh, these are all in the four and $3 range. So it's nothing wild or anything here in the stock list, but um, if you are interested in these cards, um, then you might want to pick them up. The stock list is quite good. It has a good mix of uh, poison generators. So we have cards like toxic or infect cards or cards that just automatically put a poison counter on each of your opponents like Vraska's Fall. And then we have a bunch of proliferate engines like Norn's Qu Choir Master and stuff. So once you have at least one poison counter on each of your opponents, you can start proliferating it and just adding counters that way as well too. Um, overall though, I'm going to give the stock list a B and that's not a fault to the stock list. That's more a fault of just poison as a strategy in general. Uh, generally speaking, everybody is going to be uh, focusing on dealing combat damage or like l l attacking people's life totals in commander um, and poison doesn't work on that axis. You don't actually want to lower your opponent's life title. You actually just want to give them a lethal amount of poison counters. So if you're the only person playing a poison deck, you're actually at a disadvantage at your average commander table because everybody's trying to lower life totals so they're kind of contributing to each other's game plan whereas the poison deck is doing its own goal and the second problem with poison is that it often brings a lot of unnecessary or like uh more hate than you would expect uh based on the threat level because people just don't have ways of removing poison counters. So as soon as you get one poison counter on you, people start to freak out and you get targeted a lot more, even if you're not ahead in the game and everything. So despite the stock list being actually quite powerful and very, very good, uh, it's just an inherent disadvantage to be playing a, po uh, a poison strategy at your average commander table. So I, that's why I'm gonna be giving the stock list a B. One thing I will say about the stock list though, is it doesn't actually require your opponents to be just dead from poison counters for it to do cool things. Like I really like the corrupted mechanic. It just wants you to have three or more poison counters on your opponents. And then these cards get super, super powerful. Like Geth Summons becomes one of the best like reanimation cards for mana efficient wise. Furious's Outbreak is just like a one-sided board wipe. It's really, really good. Uh, Contaminant Grafter is also great. Gliss's Retriever is also great. So I like the fact that it's not like all or nothing as poison usually is. Corrupted allows you to get extra value by just poisoning them a little bit, which is great. 
Now, in terms of upgrade potential, there is a ton of great cards that you can upgrade uh, the deck with. Um, there's a lot of cards that are just like played outside of poison decks like triumph of the hordes because it's just a great finisher uh cards that just give your opponents poison counters um just by casting them and doing something useful like infectious bite you fight something but then you also poison your opponents is great contagion engine is amazing and then like skip through risk is another great way of just like killing people very very quickly with poison these cards are all great and also the fact that you can start focusing the deck more on being like a control deck because you're going to be taking a lot of hate you can add more board wipes you can add more pillow four cards make it much more difficult for you to uh be taken out and kind of mold your deck to becoming an arch enemy uh that means uh you have a lot more potential of winning the game and a higher success rate so i'm actually going to give the upgrade potential of the deck an a despite giving the stock list just a b because once you have all the upgrades you can start being more well suited to being an arch enemy you can add cards that thrive in an arch enemy environment um and then the deck is way better um so i would say a for upgrade potential and then in terms of uniqueness, I mean, this is the first ever Poison Precon deck. Probably the first, the, the only ever Precon deck we're ever going to be getting. So it's an easy A for me. This, this is a Precon that has done something no other Precons have ever done and probably ever will. So at 11 points, I'm also going to be giving Ixil, the Corrupting Influence Precon, uh, a solid B, but I'm going to put it at the top of the B. We move on to March of the Machine with Growing Threat, which is a really cool Orzov Phyrexian deck. It's the first ever Phyrexian Matters deck, and it cares about Phyrexians and uh, Incubate Tokens, which is a brand new mechanic with March of the Machine. Uh, these are tokens that can flip into uh, Phyrexians, which are very, very cool. And I should also mention here too, all of these March of the Machine commanders they come with specific plane chase cards that you can run as plane chase commander it's like a special variant uh to add to your commander games where you have planes and they kind of affect the table um and that adds extra value but i think like out of all the people I asked, nobody cared about playing Plane Chase, or some people were interested but never actually do. Um, so I don't really add that as an extra wow factor to the deck. Like it's it's nice that these March of the Machine uh, decks have Plane Chase cards, but like I'm not adding them as a factor to my ranking guide. I'm looking specifically as normal uh, commander decks, but it is good to know that these March of the Machine commanders all have Plane Chase. So anyway, and it's all about like aristocrats sacrificing your Phyrexians for value. Uh, it has artifact sub themes too, because all your Phyrexians are mostly coming from incubate tokens, and that's really cool too. So it's Orzov, Aristocrats, Artifacts, Sacrifice them for value, um, Board Wipe a lot, and then uh, flip your tokens which survive, your incubate tokens which survive Board Wipes into creatures and start smashing face that way. The two leaders for Growing Threat are Brumaz, Blight of Oreskos, and Moira and Teshar. Moira and Teshar, I think, is a stronger overall commander. However, it doesn't really care at all about uh, Phyrexians or anything. So I feel like it's better off being a, a deck that's built around. Whereas Brumaz, the face of the commander, uh, the face commander of the deck, uh, surprise surprise is just way better as the leader of this deck um it incubates very efficiently it cares about phyrexian creatures or artifact spells that you're casting you don't have to go a full phyrexian deck you can just focus on artifact creatures and you'll get tons of value that way too but if you're focusing both on phyrexians and artifact creatures it's much easier to get maximum value out of brimaz he incubates very efficiently which turns makes artifact creature phyrexians which works really well with the rest of the deck um and then it also gives you benefit from uh your phyrexians dying so aristocrat strategies you get to proliferate um your incubate uh tokens all have plus one plus one counters on them so proliferating just means you get to put additional counters on them and then there are other counters matters cards in the deck as well too so moira and teshar is very very strong but is more its own thing and brumas is very very powerful for the phyrexian uh deck which is kind of important because this is the first time we've ever seen phyrexian matters in a set and the first time we we're ever seeing incubate so the stock list needs some help and brumas is there to do a lot of carrying of the weight now the deck price is only 48 dollars the big standout uh card over here is bitterthorn nissa's animus which sees a lot of play in just like generic uh equipment decks but everything else we've seen uh, reprinted a, a fair amount of times. Fetid Heath is four bucks. Uh, Massacre Worms has seen a lot of reprints, uh, but it's a very powerful uh, one-sided board wipe. It's also a Phyrexian. Karn's Bastion sees a lot of play in a lot of Counter Matters decks, even Super Friends. Um, so there's not a lot of like really expensive reprints here, but the standout is Bitterthorn. 
Now, the stock list is a mixed bag, and I'm gonna give it a C. Like, it is Phyrexian Artifact Aristocrats, and it does a pretty good job of showcasing that. There are 29 Phyrexians, or cards that make Phyrexians, and then there are 41 cards that make artifacts, like Incubate, or care about uh, artifacts. So, it's an artifact deck, it's a Phyrexian deck, but the reason that I'm going to be giving the stock list a C is the card draw is terrible. Like, I think the idea here is that you don't need to draw cards because you're going to be spending your mana on flipping your incubate tokens, but that's awful in practice. So I think the deck desperately needs more card draw, and it's kind of surprising how little card draw there is in the deck. I think there were like three cards that were decent card draw sources, and there's just too many hoops to draw cards in this deck. And it's a very easy fix in the upgrades, but the stock list is a C. Like I said though, it's very easy to fix this deck with a couple easy upgrades. Um, there's a lot of really good Phyrexians left over that we can add. There's a lot of good Incubate cards we can add. Uh, there's a lot of Artifact Matters cards that we can add. Uh, we can like tap our Incubate tokens with Inspiring Saturary to make a lot of mana. We can sacrifice our Incubate tokens to proliferate, which pumps up our other uh, Incubate tokens. So there's a lot of options here. And then obviously like there's so many ways of drawing cards in white and black there's so many ways of drawing cards in any color these days um it's very easy to just fix the deficit of card draw uh in the upgrades so that's why i'm going to give the upgrade potential an easy a and then in terms of uniqueness this is an easy a as well this is the first ever phyrexian matters uh pre-con deck and while we have seen artifact matters decks before this has a focus mostly on uh phyrexians and aristocrats which is very unique and also in Orzhov colors of all things as well. So very unique style deck, easy A. So with 10 points, I'm putting the Growing Threats Precon in B. Next up in March of the Machine Precons, we've got Divine Convocation. This is the first ever Convoke Matters Precon, which is very cool. Uh, it's just Sky Colors, and it's all about making a lot of tokens, then tapping them to convoke out your spells, saving a lot of mana in the process, and just overwhelming your opponents uh, with big spells that cost a lot less, thanks to Convoke. So the two commanders options over here are Kazla, the Broken Halo, and Saint Traft and Rem Kirillos. Uh, both of them uh, reward you for convoking. Uh, Saint Traft is just a nice tap engine. Uh, if you tap it to convoke your spells, uh, you get to generate more and more tokens. You get to untap it and convoke more things. Whereas Kazla is more straightforward. You can convoke her out to cost less. Uh, she's a beater in the air. Flying Vigilance Haste is always great. And then whenever you cast Convoke, you get to draw a card, which is just an amazing thing for an underrepresented uh, archetype. I think overall in the stock list, uh, surprise, surprise, the face commander Kazla is just going to be way better for the stock list. You just really need to draw cards uh, for decks like these to function. Whereas Saint Trapped, I think, has much higher potential uh, being more of a combo-y deck. Like, there's a cap to how much value you can get. You can only make three tokens per turn. But once you have something like Intruder Alarm or anything, making three tokens per turn, especially uh, on your opponent's uh, turns as well too, uh, is very, very powerful. And you can have like combo potential or the fact that if you have like convoke spells that cost one mana, uh, you could just give, chain them uh, infinitely with Saint Traff. In terms of reprint value, this is one of the cheaper decks to pick up. Uh, it's only 45 bucks and there are two real standouts. There's Nesting Duffhawk almost at $10 and the Commander Staple Skull Clamp that despite being reprinted many, many times, uh, just has so much demand that it's still staying at $6. And then we have cards like the Locust God, which is a very good token generator in the deck and Secure the Waste, which is possibly Possibly the best token generated in the entire deck. So the stock list is quite good. We have a good mix of reprints um, and all of the deck is just trying to do is generate a bunch of tokens and then use those tokens to convoke out spells. That's basically it. There are 17 token generators in the deck. There are 19 convoke cards, uh, five convoke cards that are convoke payoffs. Uh, there's pretty good reprints, uh, good new cards. Uh, the Commander Kaza is very good. But the only problem here is that Convoke is just not very strong. It's a pretty weak mechanic, 
it's never seen any support up until now. Um, so you're just working at a disadvantage here, or at least Wizards of the Coast is working at a disadvantage making this deck. And the the new cards really have to do uh, uh, pull a lot of the weight. So like Miss uh, Meadow Vanisher and Flock Chaser Phantom are very, very good cards. They were made specifically for this deck. Um, and it's just kind of carrying the weight for a kind of weak mechanic, honestly. So I have to give the stock list a B just because like, yeah, it's a token deck, but the tokens would be better served off uh, fueling a different strategy, honestly. Like, Convoke is just kind of weak. I'm also going to give the upgrade potential a B. Um, and the reason here is that, again, Convoke just doesn't have a lot of support. There's not a lot of good support uh, Convoke cards to add. However, there are like three or four or five or six, maybe very, very powerful cards that you can upgrade the deck to really juice it up. And two in particular are like night and day differences. If you can draw them in your deck, then Divine Convocation feels like an unstoppable deck where, instead of being like a mediocre one. The first one is Invasion of Segovia, which uh, flips very easily. It's a battle. It flips very easily into a creature uh, that gives all your non-creature spells Convoke, which is insane. Insane. And then it also untaps for target creatures on your end step so you can like attack and then or convoke and then untap them and you can invoke on your opponent's turn or block or whatever. And then just guy ascendancy is just absolutely busted. Like uh, you just cast non-creature spells, you get to untap all your stuff, you can tap them to convoke out another non-creature spell which is going to untap everything. It even pumps your team so you can swing for lethal as well too. It cycles through your deck, it's like absolutely busted in this deck. Um, so those two cards are like super super powerful and once you draw them in this precon suddenly the precon feels busted as opposed to being mediocre and then we have other stuff like magda for example you can tap it uh, to convoke out spells and whenever you tap it you create a treasure which is fantastic so the upgrade potential here is still a b because there's just not a lot of cards you can add to this deck to make it really powerful but the few cards that there are available are very very good so it's a solid b and then in terms of unique this is an easy A as well because this is the first ever Convoke deck. Hopefully we're going to see more Convoke Matters cards in the future and then if we do see more powerful Convoke spells and Convoke payoffs then Divine Convocation keeps getting better and better in terms of upgrade potential. So two Bs and an A, that's 10. I'm going to put it in the B category. Next up we have Tinker Time which is Teamer Artifacts and specifically Teamer Artifact Tokens and the Face Commander kind of uh, shows the uniqueness of this deck. Uh, Gimbal cares about differently named artifact tokens you control. So a clue token, a treasure token, um, the explore tokens, map tokens, or whatever those are called. Any type of tokens, gold tokens, whatever. The more you have on the battlefield, the more powerful Gimbal becomes because he makes uh, just artifact creature tokens, kind of like constructs um, that have plus one, plus one counters on them, equal to the number of artifact, differently named artifact tokens you control. So that's a whole conceit of this deck with uh, Gimbal as a leader. I do think Rashmi and Raghavan is actually way stronger. Not very strong, but way stronger than Gimbal because it doesn't ask that much of you. It just wants you to have uh, artifacts on the battlefield. It doesn't even care if they're artifact tokens, not differently named or anything. And basically when it's working very well, uh, you basically get to cast a spell from free from your opponent's uh, library and then you make a treasure token. That's it. Um, and I actually think Rashmi and Raghavan is a better leader of the stock list than Gimbal just because Gimbal, the payoff of having differently named artifact tokens is just not very high. It just makes like a bad construct and we've just seen better version of this better. Uh, whereas Rashmi and Raghavan basically lets you cast a spell for free off the top of your opponent's library and make a treasure token very, very easily and just doesn't require anything out of you. Um, both of them are kind of mediocre though. The deck price is also pretty low. It's only $42 with the most notable uh, reprint here being Academy Manufacturer, which is basically a commander staple at this point, just because we have so many sets that either focus on clues, foods, or treasure, and Manufacturer is just broken in any of those decks. It's always going to be the best card in a clue, food, or treasure deck. And the other reprints are also pretty good, but they're not very expensive. Now for the stock list, I'm going to be harsh and I'm going to give it a C. 
Um, the deck is all about focusing on artifact cards and artifact tokens. Uh, we have 15 artifact cards, 21 non-artifacts that make artifact tokens, and then 21 cards that care about artifact or tokens, but very few that actually care about differently named tokens. That's really just like a gimbal thing, and Saiyan Sep War Riders also cares about that, and I think that's basically it. Like, yeah, there are a lot of cards that care uh, that make differently named uh, tokens in the deck, like Whirl of Rogue makes Thopters, uh, schema thief makes clones of your opponent's artifacts and that's really cool and there are like token payoffs and artifact payoffs in the deck like junk winder but like the main conceit of the deck that the face commander cares about is just not really shown in the 99 which is really weird and i think a lot of the cards are kind of like they're a little bit weaker just to enable the commander who is already a weak payoff, um, which is why, again, I just say focus on Rashmi and Raghavan instead of Gimbal. Um, so overall, yeah, it's a little bit disappointing. I would say it's a C. However, artifacts are broken. So if you do actually upgrade the deck, uh, focusing on just teamer artifacts, for example, uh, you have so much to work with. Uh, artifacts is one of the most supported and beloved and popular archetypes in the format. You're in is it colors and you even have access to green, which even provides even more artifact support, which is amazing. So stuff like Fey Offering make triple the tokens uh, every single turn very easily. Jahira lets you tap all your artifacts for mana. Sarenth, uh Steel Seeker is just busted. Uh, and then Cyber Drive Awakener turns all your like clues and food and whatever tokens you have on the battlefield into a finisher. There's so much upgrade potential. This is an easy A. It just doesn't really work. You don't really have the payoff of differently named tokens. Just, that just doesn't exist outside of like Gimbal and like two other cards. Uh, but if you just focus on Teamer Artifacts, the deck is just Busterino and it's an easy A. However, the fact that it is so popular, uh, well, we've already seen uh, Artifact pre-constructed decks, a lot of them in the past already, especially in like, is it colors? We haven't seen any Teamer ones, but Overall, though, I would say this is just an artifact deck. It's just an artifact token deck. Uh, it doesn't do anything particularly special or unique. Um, so it's an easy C. Like it's not it's not special or unique in any way. It's just it's just teamer artifacts. So with just eight points, I unfortunately have to give Tinker Time a D. It's just not very exciting. Uh, the conceit of the deck just doesn't actually reflect what's going on in the 99. I don't know why they decide to go for differently named tokens. I don't know why the payoff is so bad for that too. It's just a teamer artifact deck. And honestly, there are better uh, artifact pre-cons out there. Next up, we have the March of the Machine deck Cavalry Charge. And this is just a knight deck. It just cares about knights and basically nothing else. Um, it's just about knights. You cast knights, you, ca you attack with knights, you pump your knights, you draw cards off knights, and that's basically it. So the two commanders that are potentials in the deck is Siddhar Jabari of Zalfir and Alenda and Azor. Alenda and Azor basically have no reason to be in the command zone. They just cost too much. Uh, everything they do costs way too much. Um, they're just good in the 99. Whereas Siddhar Jabari is literally made for the command zone because of the nice controversial mechanic Eminence, which says Basically, it does something even when it's never cast and can never be interacted with. Just whenever you attack with a knight, you get to loot, which is really, really good. And then when it's on the battlefield, it can start reanimating knight creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. This might make you think that this is a knight deck that has a reanimation sub-theme, but really, this is just Sadar. There's no real uh, reanimation sub-theme outside of our commander, uh, despite that being a very, very good one. So this deck, uh, price-wise, is $52, so on the lower end, uh, in terms of the pre-cons that we've been looking at. Uh, the most expensive reprint is Adeline Respun Cathar, which is one of the best knights ever printed um, and sees multi-format play. Uh, Chivalric Alliance is a new card in the deck. It just lets you draw uh, two. It's good in go wide decks and even better in knights uh, decks. And the other ones are just like, you know, five bucks, three bucks or whatever, uh, that, that uh, range. The stock list is actually quite good. Um, while I said it's just a knight deck, that's not actually a bad thing. Uh, there's 33 knights, um, and that's also a combination of knight payoff cards. So like a lot of the knights, uh, like Knight Exemplar is very good. It just gives your board indestructible and pumps them. Hakan is like the best knight ever printed, the best payoff for a knight deck and the best card in the 99 this deck. And I'm very happy that it was reprinted here. Uh, basically discard it to uh, the eminence ability of uh, Sadar. It goes into the battlefield or it goes into the graveyard. You can cast it from the graveyard and then suddenly you just cast all your knight spells from the graveyard as long as Hakan's on the battlefield. It's really, really good. A lot a lot of good knight payoff cards are in the deck, uh, which is why I'm going to give it an easy A here. Um, it's just a very solid all around uh, knight deck. 
Now, in terms of upgrade potential, this is kind of a mixed bag. I'm gonna give it an A though. Uh, in terms of actual knights that you can add to the deck, there just aren't that many left. Like knights are not a super supported uh, creature type in magic. Um, all the good ones, or most of the good ones, have already put be put in the stock list, which is why it's an easy A. There are a couple good remaining ones outside of that, like Guardian of Faith, for example, or uh, knight payoff cards like the Circle of Loyalty. But the main uh, way of upgrading the deck is not necessarily adding more knight payoffs or knight cards. It's actually uh, building up on the reanimation uh, sub theme that your commander Siddhar uh, kind of enables. It's really easy to put creatures in the graveyard. Um, therefore, stuff like wonder, giving your entire team flying is really good. Faith is, uh, filth is very good too, giving all their stuff swamp walk. And there's also a lot of like generic uh, creature type payoff cards like hindered discovery is just absolutely fantastic in the deck. So despite not having a lot of knights to add to the deck, there is a lot of potential if you start uh, expanding on the graveyard sub theme of the deck, making graveyard sub theme of the deck, or adding a generic uh, creature type payoff cards as well. So with A's across the board, that's 12 points for Cavalry Charge, and it's going to be the first A on the list. So we move from one of the best pre-cons of the year to arguably the worst one. This is the final March of the Machine uh, pre-constructed deck, Call for Backup. This is Naya Counters Matters. And it's led by two commanders. One of them is okay, pretty mediocre, and one of them is very good. So the face commander, Bright Palm Soul Awakener, uh, brings the backup mechanic, which is a, a new mechanic that was new to uh, the March of the Machine set. And it adds a counter to something and then gives that for that turn, uh, the person, the rest of the card text onto the, the creature that was bestowed the backup. Uh, so whenever the creature attacks, double the number of plus one plus one counters on target creature. Uh, it can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less this turn. So doubles counters really nice and also just smashes and makes it hard for opponents to just like chump block or just block in general. That's okay. Uh, and then the other commander is very powerful because it's very much like a combo uh, commander, Shalai and Halar. Um, it just turns all your plus one plus one counters into burn. And you have a lot of stuff that you actually can do with Shalai and Halar and not that much you can do with Bright Palm Soul Awakener. So actually, I think the face commander is just overall way worse. It's just weaker as leading the stock list and just weaker in general. And Shalai and Halar is just gonna be overall better even in the stock list and way better in the upgrade potential. In terms of deck price, it's mid, it's $51. Uh, there are two notable cards that were, one's a reprint and one's a brand new card. Colonian Hydra is just everyone's favorite plus one plus one counter enabler. Uh, it just doubles the amount of plus one plus one counters on each of your creatures when it is attacking and it grows very, very big. Uncivil Unrest is a new card. Uh, it gives all your non-token creatures a riot and then doubles the damage of creatures with plus one plus one counters on them. Uh, Guardian Scale Lord is also a brand new card. I think is the strongest of the bunch honestly and a card more people should be running in their white decks outside of plus one plus one counter decks even um so those are all just good cards and the stock list is bad this is just a straight up c like the the plus one plus one counter theme is very much here uh i counted 47 cards that care about plus one plus one counters or add plus one plus one counters onto stuff but that's not the problem here. Like there are plus one plus one counter cards and then there are plus one plus one counter payoff cards like Good Fortune Unicorn, Forgotten Ancient. Those are great ways of putting counters on your stuff. Abs and Falconer, all your stuff with plus one plus one counters have a flying together forever is great resiliency to removal. That's, that's not the problem here. The problem here is that there are four card draw spells in the entire deck and our commanders, neither of them are card advantage engines on their own. So basically you are just just like one or two board wipes away from just not doing anything in the game, uh, which is really, really bad and surprisingly bad in a pre-con deck because generally speaking, all of the pre-cons these days have been very, very good. This one just, just doesn't have card advantage for some reason. And also I would say like the uh, reprints are overall pretty lackluster. There's a lot of cards that I wish were uh, printed here that just weren't. Uh, the new cards are overall pretty good and the face commander is very bad. So if you picked Bright Palm as your commander, things get even worse. Uh, Shalai and Halar has a lot of potential, but just it's stymied uh, in the stock list. So just nothing good to say about the stock list. Like it just really needs card advantage and just isn't there. So I feel like the list just isn't going to perform very well. Um, so that's a C over here. 
Upgrade potential though is a totally different story. Plus one plus one counters has been one of the most popular and supported archetypes in existence in Magic the Gathering. So there are so many things you can do um, to make the deck way stronger if you start upgrading it. Like Damning Verdict is like a one-sided board wipe. It's amazing. And then especially if you are putting Shalai and Halar as your commander, you just have like basically auto win combos with like the Red Terror or All Will Be One, which is just infinite damage. If you have that and Shalai and Halar on the battlefield and you put a counter on something, um, that just wins you the game. So the upgrade potential is a very high A. Um, but you do have to swap it to Shalai and Halar, and you have to take out a lot of cards to make it work. And obviously you can add a lot of card advantage and stuff and fix the, the inherent problems of the stock list. And then the last thing, uniqueness, this is just a D. Like we've seen so many plus one plus one counter matters decks over the years. A lot of pre-cons have already done this. So there's just nothing exciting to say here. It's just blah, 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 D. So with the lowest score of a seven, we're putting call for backup in the D category. Next, we move away from March of the Machine to the next set, which is the Lord of the Rings set. Each of these decks have a bunch of brand new cards and all the reprints have new flavor text and artwork that depicts the Lord of the Rings universe. The first deck is Food and Fellowship. This is Abzan Food Matters. So it focuses most heavily on food tokens and it has sub themes uh, being tokens and life gain, which are two things food accomplish here tokens and they also can be cracked to generate life. We have quite a few commander options for this deck. The face commanders are two partner pairs, Frodo and Sam, which are very consistent sources of value in the deck. Frodo is a little bit clunky to get going, but once he is the ring bearer and has hit a couple times, attacked a couple times, he's a good uh, value engine um, and starts drawing you cards. Sam is way better right off the bat. It just lets you crack your food tokens for way less and it generates food. These are two amazing things. Uh, the other two partners are, are also very powerful and I would argue actually more powerful than Frodo and Sam overall in terms of like power ceiling. Uh, Pippin and Mary, they make tokens and then uh, they can just overrun and give all your creatures plus three plus three and haste in Abzan colors, which is very, very unique. And then Bilbo, birthday celebrant, um, is the life gain payoff uh, version of the deck so it's not it doesn't care about food or anything uh but you know you want to gain a bunch of life and when you're at 111 uh you basically just win the game you just dump all the creatures from your library onto the battlefield and win the game that way uh it's very telegraphed but it is also very powerful um i think overall my two favorite are frodo and sam just because they're pretty consistent and more innocuous however if all your stuff is just dying all the time anyway i think pippin and mary are probably just stronger overall like the overrun effect on Pippin is absolutely bananas. You just have a bunch of creatures on the battlefield. You can generate them on one turn and immediately give them haste and plus three plus three. It just wins games very, very easily. Um, so yeah, they're all really, really solid options. They're all A's in my book. In terms of deck price, it's actually on the high end. This is $90. Um, there's a lot of really good reprints here. Um, Toxic Deluge and Birds of Paradise are like format staples. Sun Petal Grove is also like a format staple. Anguish and Macon also format staples. So a lot of format staples in the deck and they're all Lord of the Rings themed too, which is super fun. Um, the stock list is also incredibly powerful. Like this can be taken to a regular commander night and played against custom decks and still hold its own pretty well at like casual tables. Um, there's a lot of uh, payoffs for life gain. There's a lot of food payoffs and there's a lot of token payoffs and they all work very, very well together. Between the 99 and the commanders, this is an easy A for the stock list. And then the upgrade potential is also an easy A because artifacts, uh, foods are artifact tokens and you can do a lot with those. So like Academy Manufacturer pops off, you can tap them for mana with Jahira or uh, Inspiring Statuary. You can do a lot of really busted things with artifact tokens. And they're also food and there's a lot of food support cards, especially from uh, the main set like Samwise Game G and Peregrine Took. Just make your food uh, token strategies just even better just absurdly good so there's a lot of upgrade potential here and not just um just generic upgrade potential if you want to focus on keeping the deck lord of the ring themed there's way more cards in the main set to make the deck very very powerful so samwise gary uh gamji peregrine Took, and a lot more other cards from the main set can be easily slotted to make the deck a lot better but also keep that lord of the ring seam and then when you go beyond just lord of the ring seams you have uh, even more options tons of options like the manufacturer in Jahira. 
Now, in terms of uniqueness, this is the first ever food precon we've ever seen. Like we've seen a, a, a precon commander that cares about food in the 99 of the Wolverine deck, but this is the first ever deck that actually cares about food as its main archetype. So that's incredibly unique. It's not the first ever life gain deck, but it is a focus on food and the sub themes are kind of secondary artifact tokens and life gain and that sort of stuff. Uh, so it's an easy A there, but the thing that elevates it to an S and this is the first ever S for uniqueness, is that these are all Lord of the Rings cards. They're Lord of the Rings artwork, Lord of the Rings flavor text. Um, they're all a cohesive unit of Lord of the Rings uh, artworks and flavor. And uh, even the reprints that came here that weren't printed in the main set, um, you have new artwork and new flavor text to fit the theme of the deck. So it's very cohesive and it's just so unique. You're never going to be seeing other Lord of the Rings pre-cons like these. Uh, this is an S. So not only is it unique in terms of its archetype, but it's also unique in terms of it's all unique art. It's all a cohesive Lord of the Rings universe uh, uh, pre-con IP. Um, so that is an S. So with 13 points, we get the first S rank of the year with Food and Fellowship. Next, we have the Lord of the Rings deck, Host of Mordor, where you get to play as the baddies from Lord of the Rings. This is Grixis Graveyard Spellslinger Control. It's a lot of different archetypes kind of meshed together, but it works pretty well uh, put together. So our two commanders for this deck are Sauron, Lord of the Rings, which cares mostly about graveyard and uh, creatures in the graveyard, and Saruman, the White Hand, which cares about amassing orcs by casting non-creature spells, which is kind of like the spell slinger side. So if you want to focus on like goblins and or your orc army and casting spells, Saruman is a little bit of a stronger option, whereas Sauron works better with the graveyard theme and the creature theme of the deck. Uh, which is you just put like a 9-9 on the battlefield, you amass, uh, you put like 14 power on the board, and you uh, return a creature from your graveyard to the battlefield. Um, both of them are very strong. I think Sauron is overall stronger for the stock list, where Saruman requires a lot more changing of the deck for it to be more powerful. But you can kind of see a problem with this deck already in terms of it's trying to do a lot of different things and smushing them together. And it kind of works, but it kind of doesn't. So the deck price is one of the highest that we've seen. Uh, it has some very powerful reprints like Reanimate, which is $15, and then a bunch of really powerful brand new cards. Like Cavern Horde Dragon shows up in a lot of different decks because it's just basically good in any red deck, but just gets even better in like Dragon decks, Reanimate decks, basically anything that cares about a big creature. And then we have other cards that are bizarrely very expensive, like Relic of Sauron. I'm not sure why it's so expensive, but it is. And Black Gate, which it's a pretty good land and it's also a gate, so it works very well in the gate deck. Um, but in terms of the stock list, however, uh, the problem with this deck is that it's trying to do multiple things and that kind of hurts whatever thing it's trying to do because not everything meshes well together. So I, I said it's a graveyard deck and there are 27 cards that deal with the graveyard, either uh, discarding um, them to like put stuff in the graveyard with Moria Scavenger, something that puts itself into the graveyard, the Balrog of Moria is cycling, so it puts itself in the graveyard. And then there's a bunch of ways of utilizing the graveyard, either uh, getting stuff from the graveyard, creatures from the graveyard with like Extract from Darkness, or casting uh, non-creature spells from the graveyard, like flashback spells like Wake the Dragon. The problem is that you're doing both, and then you want to have payoffs for both, and having to have payoffs for both creatures and non-creatures and having them separate from each other is kind of inconsistent in the deck. You either draw, like, you, you're you going to be filling your graveyard, but then you might draw uh, non-creature spell payoffs, but you have only creatures in your graveyard, or you have creature payoffs, but you have non-creature spells in your graveyard, and it kind of weighs down the deck and makes it less inconsistent, uh, less consistent, and therefore I'm going to actually just give the stock list a B. It's really good, it's still powerful, but it has consistency issues by not focusing on just one thing. The upgrade section though is an easy A. There are a lot of amazing upgrades that you can do to the deck. Even if you're just trying to focus on both creatures and non-creature spells, um, you can just focus on just really good payoffs at mill, like Breach the Multiverse. If you're if you're focusing on non-Lord of the Rings cards, Breach the Multiverse is very good. Vision of Ruse is just a generically good card. Um, and then if you're focusing on just being within universe, even within universe, you have a lot of really powerful cards like Star and the Dark Lord or One Ring to rule them all. Um, 
so even if you want to upgrade the deck and power it up, uh, you can focus on just Lord of the Rings cards or focus on any type of cards. And if you do start upgrading the deck, you can start focusing on making the deck more cohesive uh, by picking a graveyard theme. You can either uh, po focus on creatures, creature graveyard synergies, or focus on non-creature graveyard synergies, or focus on Spellslinger, or focus on like, orc armies. You can do anything, but just pick one and focus on that one, and the deck gets suddenly way, 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 way better. In terms of uniqueness, I will say that I'm giving it a bump in rating because it's all unique art. It's a Lord of the Rings pre-con. So everything, every single card is cohesive and in universe for Lord of the Rings. So I'm giving that one extra point. However, I'm going to dock it because it's not like the first graveyard deck ever. It's not the first Spellslinger deck ever. It's like the third graveyard deck and like the third Spellslinger deck. So while I really appreciate the fact that it's all unique art and everything, and that definitely gives it a bump in its uniqueness, overall, I'm still just going to give it a B because it's not doing anything particularly new or exciting in the stock list, but it is very unique in terms of the art and the flavor and everything, so it's a B. So with 10 points overall, I'm going to be putting uh, the Hosts of Mordor into the B category. Next, we've got the Lord of the Rings deck Elven Council. This is a Simic voting deck with also an elf theme to it as well and the name of the deck elven console kind of says what it's trying to do it's voting and elves and a lot of the focus on the face commander options are also uh, voting themed. Like Galadriel is Will of the Council. This is a voting effect. Uh, Arrestor is a payoff for your voting. Um, then we have like random wizards that I have no idea why they're here, but Gandalf and, and Radicast are both here for some reason. I don't know. They have nothing to do with elves or voting, but here they are. Uh, and then certain uh, the Shipwright and Elrond also are about voting. However, most of these are just not very good. <laughs> And when we look at the stock list, um, there's just not that much voting going on. And I don't know why Radagast and Gandalf are here. They don't do anything uh, with the, the main themes of the deck. Um, so when we look at the deck prices, it's also on the higher end. Uh, Raise the Palisade is the most expensive card. It used to be a budget deck, a uh, budget card when I was tweeting about it, but apparently oops a daisy for tweeting about it. It's now $17. And there's a really good reprint with Heroic Intervention and Lightning Greaves. A lot of really expensive cards here, basically. The stock list is where I start having some issues with the deck. Despite being called Elven Council and having a lot of face commanders that deal with voting, there's only seven voting cards and two voting payoff cards in the entire deck, which is very disappointing, incredibly disappointing. And not even all the good voting decks uh, cards even showed up in the 99. At the very least, like they're not expensive. You might as well have put them in the deck, Watsy. But like, there's just nothing here. It's really just like an elf deck but like a half-hearted an elf deck with a half-hearted voting theme and even the the elf part of the deck is kind of disappointing too there are 23 elves and only eight elven payoff cards to it the new cards are also kind of weak which is very disappointing and all of the commanders are also pretty weak like elrond is the strongest of the bunch if you make it like a blink commander or something like that but then it's not even like an elf voting deck it's just elrond blink i don't know this is very very sad, very sad indeed. So I'm gonna give the stock list a C. Like, I've seen the deck in action quite often and there are some draws where the elven deck actually looks kind of powerful, where you draw your elven, elvish arch druid or whatever and it looks sweet, but most often it's just kind of stumbling around and hoping that each other, the opponents kind of deal with each other and then you can swoop in and hopefully get a win, but like a lot of the cards are really bad. <laughs> Um, the upgrade potential, though, is a lot higher um, if you're focusing on elves. <laughs> if you're focusing on elves, then congratulations, you are in green. So you have access to all the best uh, elf payoff cards, uh, like Azuri, Renegade Leader. Um, if you're focusing on voting, then you're kind of out of luck because there's very few other voting cards available. There are a couple really powerful ones, like Expropriate. And if you want to turn this into, like, Simic Elves, which have a scrying something to the main set, and I have no idea why there's no scrying sub theme to uh, this set. It should have been called Elven Scrying, and you should have focused on elves and scrying because the main set is about scrying. Um, if you focus on elves and scrying, then you have a lot more to work with, and you just take out the voting cards. Um, so I would give this a B. Like, if you want to focus on a voting deck, which is 
the unique part of, of this deck, I guess. There's just not that much to do with it, it's unfortunately. If you want to focus on elves, then there's a lot to do with, but you're just better off putting, like, Azuri Renegade Leader as your commander. Like, what are you doing with all these other cards? Um, and if you want to focus on scrying, you, you're just also better off just building from scratch, unfortunately. Um, so I'm going to give this a B. Like, yeah, you could upgrade it, but you'd m be much rather off just... Building a new deck, honestly. <laughs> in terms of uniqueness, I think this is the second ever elf precon, uh, but it is also the first ever voting precon, if it just unfortunately just isn't very really good at voting. Um, and also it has all new, unique uh, Lord of the Rings art. So overall, I'm just gonna give it an A in terms of uniqueness. Like, yeah, if it did a better job at being a voting deck, um, then that would be great for the stock list uh, criteria and everything in the upgrade list criteria. But nonetheless, they did try to make something unique. So I'm going to give it high marks for that. So it gets an A. I'm not going to lie. The Alvin Council, I had high hopes for, but I was very disappointed once I actually dug into it and saw it in action. So this one's a C, the, the lowest, the weakest of the Lord of the Rings precons. But fret not, Lord of the Rings fans, because we have another sweet one coming up. This is Riders of Rohan. This is Jeskai Hugh. Humans, and it has a monarch sub theme to it and this one is very sweet you basically just want to play a bunch of humans you want to be attacking with humans you go wide with humans you pump up your humans you draw cards off your humans and you have a monarchy sub theme where you just get the crown and if anybody dares attack you uh you're gonna smash them really really hard so odds are people just will not contest your crown because you have a huge army and uh i have seen this one in action and has gone toe to toe with people's custom casual decks too so this is on the strong end i'm um, just spoiler alert um so the two commanders that make the most sense for riders of rohan is eowyn shield maiden and aragorn king of gondor aragorn makes more sense if you're focusing on the monarch sub theme but eowyn makes more sense when you are focusing on the human sub theme both of them are very very powerful but eowyn is uh focusing on the main primary theme of the deck which is humans and aragorn focuses on marquee which is a sub theme of the deck so i just think eowyn is just way better suited as the face commander of of the deck and they're both really really strong like Eowyn I think is even stronger because she makes uh, human tokens and she draws you cards at the same time uh, whereas Aragorn is more soft power uh, just getting the monarchy and then being able to just alpha strike somebody very, very easily getting around their blockers is really really good um, and he also has Vigilance Lifelink which is really sw uh, swell as well too uh, but I just think Eowyn's better in the stock list uh, in terms of the deck price is also on the higher end um, it's $91. Fourth Eero Lingus is weirdly the most expensive card because it sees Legacy play, I believe. Legacy play uh, is just very, very good at 1v1. Who would have thought? Um, and then we have, like, I don't know why Door of Destinies is so expensive. Um, I think this card is kind of overrated, but it is seven bucks. Um, Herald's Horn, Vanquish's Banner, just a lot of like good generic uh, creature payoff cards are, are can be found here, and that's always great. In terms of the stock list, the stock list is very, very, very good. Like I said, I've seen this go toe to toe with custom decks, like casual decks, not like super high powered or anything, but like you can bring it to your FNM or whatever, play uh, Commander Knight, and it's going to do pretty well out of the box, which is pretty insane. It has a lot of humans, a lot of human payoff cards, a little bit of a monarch payoff to it too, but the main focus is just attacking and casting humans, attacking with humans and all that stuff too, um, and it does it really, really well. So that's a solid A, especially with the commanders who are already very powerful. And then the upgrade potential is very high too. It's an easy A. Uh, if you want to focus just on Lord of the Rings cards, we have a lot of Lord of the Rings cards from the main set that are very powerful here, like Boromir and the uh, other Eowyn. And then if you go beyond um, just uh, Lord of the Rings cards, there's so many payoff cards for humans outside of that. Kindred Discovery is generic, but like Mass Appeal, pay three mana, draw cards for each human control and you're go wide humans deck. Like you're gonna draw like six cards off this very easily. Um, there's a lot of potential here, so that's also an easy A. So A is across the board. And then we come to uniqueness. This is the second ever Humans Matters precon. There was a Mardu one in our Ikoria. It's different colors. It's Mardu instead of Jeskai, but there is a lot of overlap, obviously. Um, so it's not the most unique uh, out there in terms of archetype, but like I said, all the Lord of the Rings uh, commanders have brand new art. Even the reprints have brand new art that focuses on the IP. So that's great, and that bumps it up. And that's why I'm gonna give it overall an A. So just A's across the board. 
So with A's across the board and just being an incredibly powerful uh, precon right out of the box and having so much upgrade potential, this is an easy A. This card, this this precon is amazing. And the only thing that makes it not an S compared to Food and Fellowship is the fact that we've seen a human deck before and it already overlaps on two of the colors. Um, so it's not entirely super unique. And if you don't really care about that, then who cares really, right? But uh, really strong uh, deck right out of the box and lots of upgrade potential. All right, we move from Lord of the Rings over to Commander Masters. And we're kicking things off with possibly the most popular uh, homemade creature type in Magic the Gathering uh, with Slivers. Everybody loves Slivers. And this is five color Slivers called Sliver Swarm. And it's the first ever Sliver deck ever made, which is also very exciting. Um, so the commanders to lead the deck, we have two brand new ones, Sliver Grave Mother and Rakuramel. And we also have a reprint with Sliver Hive Lord. Of the, of the three, I think Silver Grave Mother and Silver Hive Lord are the two best options to lead the sock list, whereas Recruitment is really sweet if you want to do some upgrading and merge slivers with other creature types, which this deck does does not do. Every other card basically in the deck is a sliver except for Recruitment. Um, So it doesn't really have that much value in the stock list. Silver Grave Mother adds a graveyard sub theme to the deck where you can start encoring uh, slivers from the graveyard to smash people for a lot of damage. In Silver Hive Lord, it just makes sure that your slivers just don't die very easily. They're both really good in the command zone, but I think Silver Grave Mother is just better. The deck price is also on the high end. It's $95. Uh, the brand new card, Titan of the Jar, is just really good in any blue creature deck. Um, and we have a lot of good reprints, like Three Visits, and then new cards like Descendants Fury and For the Answers. These all just care about creature types and they're generic enough that uh, multiple decks uh, want them. Overall, the stock list is very good. I counted 40 slivers, nine sliver support cards, and then 27 cards that care about attacking. So this deck is very much not just slivers, but it has a, an attacking sub theme. So a lot of like combat triggers and attack triggers, such like that. Um, the main downside of the deck is that the mana base is very disappointing. Uh, it's a lot of tap lands and it's just slow. Um, so you're not gonna be curving out as well as you would like. It's the, the mana base is very consistent. It will let you cast your spells, but usually a turn later than you would like. So that is very disappointing for a five color deck, uh, but kind of expected, honestly. But the rest of the cards are very, very good. And also the new cards are exceptional too. Like we have a lot of really good reprints like Cloud Shredder Sliver is one of the best slivers, but like the new cards are also really, really good too, like Re Regal Sliver and Hatchery Sliver. And I will also say that there's no really, not really a graveyard theme at all to this deck. So you would think Sliver Grave Mother would be like oh this is sliver graveyard but really no sliver grave mother just kind of gives your deck more uh reach uh so if you get board wiped or something sliver grave mother's out there being able to encore your slivers for one more hit and it's very effective but it's not a graveyard deck it's a sliver attack deck that's what it really is so I'll give Sliver Swarm a B out of the stock list. Like the, the slivers and all of the cards that aren't lands are really good, but I'm gonna be docking a point because the mana base is just kind of disappointing. It's kind of slow. It's consistent. You can cast all your spells pretty reliably, but it is slow. Now the upgrade potential is very high. It's an easy A. There aren't that many powerful slivers that I would recommend adding to the deck, but the ones that are available are incredibly powerful. Uh, Silver Legion, Silver Overlord, the first Silver, these are like five color Silver powerhouses that are gonna add so much juice to the deck. And then we have like a cheeky card like Homing Sliver, which works very well with the Grave Mother. It just lets you tutor a bunch of stuff and put Slivers into the graveyard, which is also very important for Sliver Grave Mother. Um, but the biggest thing that you can do with the upgrades is like upgrade the lands, for example, to make your lands better and not just all tap lands. Uh, uh, upgrade it with like generic staples too. There's a lot of upgrade potential for the deck. It's just that there aren't that many Slivers to add, but the Slivers you can add are very powerful and high impact. In terms of uniqueness, this is an easy A. It's the first Sliver Precon, so obviously it's just an easy A. So with two A's and a B, that's 11 points, and that puts Silver Swarm at the top of the B list. Next up in Commander Masters, we have Planeswalker Party, which is the first ever 
Jeskai Planeswalker deck, aka Super Friends. So it's all about casting your Planeswalkers, taking them up, and protecting them, and eventually winning the game off your Planeswalkers with their powerful ultimate abilities, or turning them even into creatures and smashing face with them as well. The two potential leaders of the deck is Commodore Guff, which is itself a Planeswalker and can easily tick up to start generating more mana to cast your Planeswalker spells, but also make chump blockers, which is very fun too. And also Liori Spark Touch Hunter, which allows a certain Planeswalker type, like you have to name like Jace or Chandra or whatever, uh, to basically uh, be a Strionic Resonator. Whenever you activate a Planeswalker ability of that type, uh, you get to double it. So it's like a little bit of a Panharmonicon, but only for one Planeswalker type. In terms of the stock list, I think Commodore Guff is just easily way better as the stock list because he helps all of your Planeswalkers pretty well with his passive ability, with his plus one that acts as a chump blockers and ramp, uh, and his negative three, which uh, draws cards and deals damage equals the number of Planeswalkers you control. However, if I was focusing on a deck that's focused on just like one or two Planeswalker types, like Jace and Chandra, or just like just Chandra, for example, then I think Leori gets a lot better because it just doubles all of your Chandra abilities too, uh, which is really, really good. But overall, they're both just really good commanders, and Commodore Grow Up is just perfect for the stock list. Uh, speaking of the stock list, the deck price is $75. Um, so on the higher end, uh, it has a lot of really great staples uh, like Spark Double, which shows up in a lot of different decks, not just Planeswalkers. The Chain Veil, which is a Super Friends staple. And then there are uh, new cards that work very well in Super Friends, like Vronos Vast, uh, Masked Inquisitor. And then Chandra Awakened Inferno shows up not just in Planeswalker decks, but uh, in other decks as well, too. The stock list is quite good. Um, I count only 19 Planeswalkers, which sounds like on the lower end. However, there are 16 support cards and a lot of cards to actually protect your Planeswalkers, which is probably the hardest thing to do in Commander. Uh, Planeswalkers are just so easily attacked and got, gotten rid of by just combat damage in a multiplayer game because you have to protect against three different people. And this deck actually does a really good job at protecting your Planeswalkers. So yeah, like the Planeswalker number count is on the lower end, but the amount of protection you have means those Planeswalkers are gonna stick around a lot better. And that plus the Commander Commodore Guff being very strong means I will give the stock list an A. Now the upgrade potential is also an A. There's a lot of Planeswalkers that are very good in the deck uh, that you can add to make the deck much stronger. There's a lot of Planeswalker support cards you can be adding, like proliferate stuff like Ikramorn Gauntlet. And then if you want to be very mean, there are some cards that just kind of end you the game as soon as you have basically any good Planeswalker on the battlefield, like Joko Hobbs, which destroys all artifacts, creatures, and lands. But guess what? It leaves your Planeswalker alone. So if you have any Planeswalker that can just kind of win the game if left alone for a couple turns, you can just cast that and then Joko Hobbs, and then you basically wrapped up the game in a nice bow tie. It's mean, not a lot of people will want to do that, but the option is definitely there. So it's an easy A overall. And then in terms of uniqueness, well, this is the first ever Super Friends deck. There have been uh, uh, commander decks led by Planeswalkers that can be your commander. However, none of them have ever cared about Planeswalkers as an archetype. So this is the first ever one, easy A. So with triple A, that's 12 points and it goes easily into the A category. Next up, we have the first ever colorless deck. This is the Eldrazi Unbound Precon from Commander Masters. And like I said, this is about colorless matters despite the name being Eldrazi Unbound, it's not really an Eldrazi deck. Uh, the commanders that we can have to lead the deck are kind of interesting. There's Zolduck, which is a face commander. It's a new one, and it cares about color spells. So again, colorless matters and gives them Cascade Cascade, which is great. There's Omarthus Ghostfire Initiate, which absolutely does not fit well in this deck at all. I feel like it was kind of thrown in there as an option for a future Colos Commander deck. It cares about plus one plus one counters, and this deck is not at all about either manifesting or plus one plus one counters. Not, none of that is happening in this deck, so it's very weird to ha have it included. And weirdly enough, the reprint commander, Kozilek the Great Distortion, is arguably the best commander to lead the deck. Yeah, it's it's a reprint, so it's not new, it's not exciting. It doesn't have Cascade Cascade on it, but it just kind of wins games in the command zone because it's two shots opponents and just casting it uh, does a lot of stuff. It's just like a one-man army, basically. And so weirdly enough, even in the stock list, Kozilek is a lot better, but I do agree that Zolduck is more interesting and it's a new one, so you might as well play with that as the face commander, honestly. Just take out Omarthus. Omarthus is bad. 
The deck price is very high. It's $120 because a lot of the cards here are very, very sweet. Uh, Rise of the Aldrazi is a brand new card and it sees plays outside of just Commander. Uh, Darkseal Monolith is very exciting too. It fits very well in Artifact X2. Uh, then there's a reprint that betrays, which much need a reprint. It's already $6 still. Uh, Flare of Loyalty is another very exciting one that also sees play outside of Commander, I want to say. Um, so yeah, just a lot of really, really good cards here. And also the basic lands, Waste. Um, they haven't seen a reprint since they were first printed and you get like 15 of them or something in the deck. So that's also really, really good. Um, in terms of the stock list, uh, it's a mixed bag. There are a lot of very powerful cards here, but I think a lot of people who buy the precon based on the name Eldrazi Unbound are going to be very disappointed. Despite the name Eldrazi Unbound, this is not an Eldrazi deck. There are only 12 Eldrazi cards in the deck, and there's only one card that cares about Eldrazi in the entire deck. It is actually a colorless matters deck. Every single card is colorless, and there are 15 payoffs for playing colorless cards. There's also a lot of really good reprints here, like Ugin the Ineffable, uh, Forsaken Monument, All is Dust. Like, these are fantastic reprints. However, the deck overall is pretty inconsistent. There's a lack of really good card draw in the deck, and there's a lack of board wipes. There are good board wipes. I sh I'm showing you two of them on the board right now, All is Dust and Calamity of the Titans. But the deck kind of needs more than that, and it needs some card draw. Like, being able to double Cascade with your Zolduck is not very good if you have no more cards in your hand once you cast Zolduck. So, just like swapping out uh, Zolduck for Kozilek, which can redraw your hand, is actually very, very good, even for the stock list. That's why I like Kozilek so much. So I'm gonna give the stock list a B, unfortunately. However, the upgrade potential is an easy A. Like, there are so many good colorless cards that you can be adding. You can actually turn this deck into an Eldrazi deck if you actually want to. Like, there's the other Eldrazi Titans you can be adding, like those like Blue Shore of Truth and the Ulamogs. Uh, there's other cards that uh, help you do uh, Eldrazi things like Conduit of Ruin. There's more board wipes you can be adding that works very well with uh, colorless like Ugin. And there's a lot of really good ramp options like Ancient Tomb, for example, that are fantastic in this deck. In terms of uniqueness, this is an easy A, and this is going to be also one of the most ambitious uh, pre-cons that the design team have ever done. It's the first ever colorless deck. Uh, it's the only only uh, Colorless Matters deck, and despite the name being Eldrazi Unbound, it's not actually an Eldrazi deck, so I can't actually give them unique points for that. However, all things considered, easy A, it's the first ever Colorless Matters deck, and it probably was very difficult for them to actually make it work. So with one B and two A's, I will say the stock list is a little bit disappointing, but the upgrade potential is very, very good, and the uniqueness is definitely there. I'm going to be putting Eldrazi Unbound into the B category. Very good overall. The final pre-con from Commander Masters is Enduring Enchantress. This is Abzan Enchantress with a little bit of a twist. So the twist comes from our commanders, Anikvia, which is the face commander, and Narsi. Narsi works with sacrificing enchantments, which is something we haven't seen before, and it works particularly well with sagas, which ha also happen to sacrifice themselves upon resolution. Anikvia cares about enchantment creatures, and it also specifically cares about non-auras because it is a graveyard sub-theme that can let you reanimate non-auras, uh, non-aura enchantments and turn them into enchantment creatures that perform the same way, but now they're also zombies. For the stock list, Anikthia is the clear winner. There are some sagas in the deck, but they're just not enough to make Narsi uh, really, really good. However, if you upgraded both of them, they're both equally powerful. Uh, Narsi is very good if you add a lot more sagas and change up the deck more, whereas Anikthia just kind of works much better out of the box. In terms of deck price, it's kind of mid to high. Um, the biggest card that's a uh, new card is Undo Spirit Dancer, which is kind of like Enchant Harmonicon, it just makes co copies of the enchantments you cast. Um, and then there's like Dried of the Listen Grow because it's good in Enchantress and also land decks. Ghoulish Impetus, I have no idea why it's that expensive, honestly. Composer of Spring is also uh, fantastic in Enchantress. The stock list is very, very good. Um, Enchantress is one of the most supported archetypes in the entire game. We've seen Enchantress being printed and reprinted to death in Commander Precons and also main sets. And there's just so much, so many good cards to choose from. It's very easy to cobble together a cheap stock list out of it, which is what WotC exactly did. There's a lot of cards that let you draw cards whenever you're making enchantments, a lot of cards that make a lot of mana uh, when you have a lot of enchantments on the battlefield, and just, just random stuff that 
just do really good things when you have enchantments on the battlefield like Dooming Giant. Um, so the cards are very, very good. It's an easy A. It's just incredibly powerful. And the upgrade potential is also an easy A. Like it, like I said, Enchantress is one of the most supported archetypes. There's so many enchantment stuff that you can be adding to the deck. It's going to be actually hard to find space for all of them, honestly. Um, so yeah, you're going to have a field day. If you love Enchantress, this is a great pre-con for you. However, where I'm going to be dinging during enchantments is that this is like the 50th <laughs> enchantment pre-con we've seen. Okay, it's not the 50th. It's actually the third one. But that's three commander precons that we've already seen so we're not actually breaking new ground or anything um that said like i mean if you love enchantress who cares right you just take the enchantress deck that you like um and it does have a graveyard sub theme to it and it focuses on non auras so there is a little bit of stuff here that's a little bit unique but overall it's just an enchantress deck all enchantress decks all play to it the same way like you're just playing the enchantresses and draw card whenever you make enchantments you play all the busted enchantress payoff cards and then, yeah there's a little bit of a sub theme there too but it's an enchantress deck it's an enchantress deck it's a c c uniqueness so with two a's and a c this puts enduring enchantress in the b category all right we move away from commander masters over to wilds of Eldraine, where we got two new commander precons the first one is fade the minion and let me tell you folks this was the most excited I've ever been for a Commander Precon deck. I am a big fairy believer, a big fairy stan. I love fairies. And this one, we'll get to this one. Anyway, this is uh, Demir Fairies. It has a fairy main theme, which is all about just casting fairies and fairies matters. And it has a kind of like casting on your opponent's turns matters, like a flash uh, sub theme to it. And I, I emphasis on the sub theme. So. The commander options here, there's at least four, I think. Uh, two new ones, Tegwill and Alila. Tegwill is like fairy aristocrat, where it pumps up your fairies, and then whenever your fairies die, you get to draw cards and lose life. Uh, it's okay. There's no aristocrat cards in the entire deck, by the way, and fairies are not supporting aristocrats. Kind of weird. And then there's Alila, Cunning co uh, Conqueror, the one that I like a lot more, which is part of the 99. It's not the face commander. It's whenever you cast uh, a spell on your opponent's turn, you get to make fairies, and you get to go with people and it deals with like casting on your opponent's turn which is something fairies have been uh doing for a very long time and then we have like nimerous which uh rewards casting stuff at instant speed and uno which just kind of like vomits out a bunch of fairies while milling your opponents i think for the commander um i think tegwell is probably the best one i wish it wasn't the case uh for the stock list because it's just bland generic value um but if you do upgrade it i think alila gets a lot more exciting or even nimerous gets a lot more exciting Exciting too. Um, for the deck price, it's mid. Um, it's $56 currently. Uh, the most exciting new card out of it is Misleading Signpost. It's a mana rock that lets you redirect attacks when it enters the battlefield. Very cute. It's about $6 right now. Uh, and then we have uh, some pretty good fairy payoff cards like Kindred Dominance and some good fairies like Brazen Borrower is $6 and Glenelanger Archmage is $6. Um, the stock list though is a mixed bag. There's a strong fairy theme. Overall though, the cards are on the weaker end and the commander options are weak at least for the stock list so overall i'm gonna give it a b like there are some really good cards there's also some really weak cards so it's inconsistent it really depends on what you're drawing but overall i've seen this stock list in action i haven't been very impressed with it honestly in terms of upgrades this is also a b because while there are some good cards to be adding there's really good uh fairy cards like spell starter sprite which should have been in the freaking stock list i don't know what the heck why it wasn't there wizards um bitter blossom is also another really good one fairy mastermind works with fairies and also casting on your opponent's turn just like spell starter sprite actually and you can also expand like the casting on your opponent's turn theme with cards like slither wisp and stuff which is not a fairy but it works with that sort of theme there's stuff to do there but there's just not a lot of cards right there's not a lot of really good fairies left to add there's not a lot of casting on your opponent's turn left to add um so there's like generic cards that you can be adding but uh, in terms of supporting the main themes it's not that there's just not that much unfortunately so it's a b there are some good stuff but b in terms of uniqueness though, this is a unique deck. It's the first every fairy deck. I was super stoked for it because it was the first ever fairy deck, so that's an A. I just kind of feel that the stock list was a little bit disappointing. Sorry. So two Bs and an A means that the fairy deck is a solid B. The second Wilds of Old Drain commander deck is Virtue and Valor. And guess what? 
We got Enchantress back. It's been one set, but we got Enchantress back. This is Selesnya Enchantress. It's not Abzan Enchantress, uh, so, but still two of the same colors. But this one focuses on auras, where the last one, Enduring Enchantress, specifically did not focus on auras. So there is a little bit of a difference here. The uh, commander options for the deck, there are quite a few, uh, but the ones that make the most sense are Eliveri and Gluane, uh, casting director. Eliveri is the stronger of the two. When it ETBs or attacks, you get to put auras on your creatures for free. And then when your uh, enchanted creatures uh, deal damage, you get to draw cards. It's just very good, very good, very clean, concise. Whereas Gilwain uh, just wants you to focus on creatures, just that you cast creatures and they all get rolls on them very easily. So it's not even that much focus on uh, Enchantress as Ellie Vary is, in my opinion. Uh, it just wants you to cast all those creatures. It's more focus on creatures than the aura side is what I'm trying to say. The other two, the reprints, they're okay, but they're just not as good as commanders. In terms of deck prices, it's mid. It's only 50 bucks. The most notable reprint is Hall of Helia's Generosity. Um, there are other good cards too, like Bear Umbra and Mantle of the Ancients, and there's a new card, Songbird's Blessing, and they're all auras. They work with the aura theme, and they're just good for any aura deck, basically. Now, the stock list is an easy A. Like I said, Enchantress has so much support, and we keep getting more and more precons for them. Um, so, yeah, surprise, surprise. Uh, there's a lot of cheap cards that they added here that are nonetheless staples for the Enchantress archetype and the Auras archetype. So we have the usual Enchantress Presence and Sanctum Weaver, but then we also have stuff that are Aura-themed, like Core Spirit Dancer, which is Enchantress specifically for Auras, Ethereal Armor, like, emphasis on Aura stuff. So easy A there. And then the upgrade potential obviously is also an A. Uh, you just have more busted staple Enchantress support cards that uh, you can be adding to the deck. So Argothian Enchantress, Replenish, these are just generic Enchantress staples. And then if you focus on the aura part, you have a lot of very powerful auras you can be adding to, like Ancestral Mask and all that glitters to end the game. Now, in terms of uniqueness, this is a C or a D. And I'm gonna feel charitable and I'm just gonna give it a C. This is the third Auras deck, or third Auras Commander Precon deck, and it's now the fourth Enchantress Precon deck because during Enchantress, uh, we just covered uh, a set earlier. So it's very much like we have so many Enchantress decks at this point. I'm, uh, there's so many. So just pick your favorite at this point. Pick your flavor, and they're all they're all great. <laughs> they're all great, but they're not unique. But they're they're great. So two A's and a C puts the Virtue and Valor precon also in B. So we move on from Wilds of Eldraine over to the Doctor Who set, and we're starting with Timey Wimey. This is Jeskai Time Counters, or rather Time Travel. So it's focusing basically on two different things. Um, suspending spells, casting them from exile with time counters on them, and also permanence with vanishing. And you, they have time counters and you remove them, and when you have no more time counters, uh, they get sacrificed. So you wanna be adding counters to your vanishing stuff so they last longer, and removing time counters um, from your stuff with uh, suspend so they get cast earlier. So that's the whole gimmick here. And the commander options are the biggest we've ever seen. It would be more to fill up this entire screen. It wouldn't make sense. So basically, there's like a bunch of Time Lord Doctors, the different Doctor types, and then different Doctor's Companions. And you can have one Doctor, any of them, any Time Lord Doctor, and any Doctor's Companion in the Command Zone. So they're basically like a special Commander rule set where you can only mix and match between the two. You can only have one Time Lord Doctor and one Doctor's Companion. And if you have one of each, then you can have both in the Command Zone. And the face ones are 10th Doctor, and Rose Tyler and uh, the 10th Doctor kind of shows what you want to be doing is you want to be exiling stuff uh, with suspend uh, so they have time uh, time counters on them and then you time travel which is the brand new mechanic where you can either add or remove a time counter onto something and Rose Tyler just kind of works well with suspending stuff basically um, in terms of the deck price, it's very expensive. It's $113. And uh, two of the big reasons for that is Everybody Lives, which is a very powerful new card in Commander in general. Um, and then Dinosaurs on a Spaceship, $17 because people love dinosaurs, basically. That's why. Um, and then we have other really good cards like Flesh Duplicate and new uh, really good uh, staples like Farewell being printed here as well. The stock list is about a B, in my opinion. Uh, it has a very strong theme on time counters, either um, putting time counters on permanence or removing time counters from stuff with suspend. Um, there's a lot of things just care about counters um, and a lot of stuff to manipulate counters with time travel, which is the brand new mechanic. 
Um, it all works quite well in terms of a cohesive unit. However, I did see when I was looking at the new cards and the reprints and stuff, they were on the weak end, honestly. Like there are some really good ones and I'm showing the good ones on the screen right now, but there was a lot of ones that were just kind of like, huh? Like why? No. And, and yeah, it just didn't really work out for me. So I'm gonna give it an overall B. It's very cohesive, but it's just like overall weak cards. And then for upgrades, I'm unfortunately gonna have to give this a C as well because there's just not a lot of time counter cards available to be adding. Like there's just not a lot of really good suspend cards that you can be adding. And there's not a lot of really good vanishing cards you can be adding as well. Like there are a couple, there are a handful, but overall it's just not gonna make that big of an impact when you add them to the deck. And also, unlike Lord of the Rings, which had a main set that came along with it to bolster uh, the set, the mechanics of the precons, uh, the the Who sets are just Doctor Who uh, preconstructed decks. There are no other cards you can be adding that have time travel or whatever or suspend uh, to bolster it. So overall, it's just a C. However, for uniqueness, just like the Lord of the Rings decks. Uh, these are all brand new artworks. They're all in universe for Doctor Who. Even the reprints are new art and new flavor text. And this is the first ever deck that cares about time counters. So the fact that it's the first ever deck that cares about time counters and the first ever, like it's a totally unique Doctor Who deck, I have to give it an S in terms of uniqueness. So with a B, a C, and an S, I'm gonna be giving Timey Wimey, uh, no, it's a B, a low B. I'm gonna put it at the end of the line, but yeah, it's very unique. The next Doctor Who Commander deck is Paradox Power. And this one cares about casting stuff outside of your hand, most often being like Suspend Cards or Cascade or stuff like that, or Impulse Draw. And it ties that together with plus one plus one counters as the major payoff for doing so. Uh, it is Teamer Colors. The Commanders, again, there's a bunch of Time Lord Doctors, a bunch of Doctors Companions, and you can mix and match them however you want. But the Face Commanders do a good job explaining what the deck is all about. Uh, the 13th Doctor uh, puts plus one plus one counters as a payoff for whenever you're casting stuff outside of your hand um, and then it untaps your creatures each turn which works very well with like Yasmin for example which can tap to exile the top card of your library and you can cast it until your next end step so they work very very well together they're a very good team and they're casting stuff from exile which means put, putting plus one plus one counter stuff and untapping stuff it's great now the deck price is $74 uh, the, surprise surprise a dinosaur from here is the most expensive card, Flaming Tyrannosaurus. Again, people just love dinosaurs. Um, there's a really cool reprint of Carpet of Flowers. I thought that was a reserved list card, honestly. Uh, there's a cool new uh, copy card, and there's some decent lands as well too, like Storm Card Coast. The stock list is again, kind of a mixed bag. It has a strong cast from anywhere outside of your hand theme. Uh, you can cast stuff like Fortel, you can suspend like we talked about before. Even casting stuff like that, uh, the non-adventure side, once something goes on an adventure like twice upon a time even demonstrate works well too there's a lot of different ways of casting stuff outside of your eggs outside of exile other than just like suspending it and that's admirable but like the payoffs are kind of weak and a lot of the cards that they're running are also kind of weak so i would say it's overall a b it's very cohesive but the power just isn't really there. However, the upgrade potential definitely is there. It's definitely a solid A, like there's no more Doctor Who cards to be adding to the deck really. However, uh, casting stuff from Exile has been a pretty well established um, thing in red. Uh, we've seen it with Prosper, we've seen it in Faldorn. Um, there's a lot of support for it. So stuff like Passionate Archaeologist is absolutely fantastic in this deck, especially when you have two commanders. Uh, so double the damage potential. Faldorn is great, Keeper of Secrets, another payoff, Delayed Blast, fireball if you ever get to like uh, suspend it or whatever it's absolutely fantastic so yeah there's a lot of a lot of different payoff cards from casting from outside of your hand now in terms of uniqueness i'm going to give this one an a not an s because casting from anywhere outside of your hand while that is the first time we're seeing it it basically means casting from exile let's be real here all, all the cards that we're looking at are basically casting from exile um and we've seen two decks already do that prosper and faldorn so i'm gonna give it like one minus minus one point on that one um in terms of uh, the other uniqueness though is that all the artwork is brand new to doctor who uh all the reprints are brand new to doctor who so obviously the deck is very unique in that regard as well too so i'm gonna overall give it an a so two a's and a b i'm gonna put it in the b range Next from Doctor Who, we have Masters of Evil, where you get to play the villains of the Doctor Who universe. This is Grixis, Artifact, Creature, Control, 
with villainous choice, which is a new type of voting thing. Um, so yeah, it's all about being the evil mustache twirling villain, giving your opponents two bad options essentially. And also it has a strong artifact creature theme to it with a little bit of sacrificing. So there's a lot of commanders options here as well too. There's no doctors and doctor companions, thank goodness, uh, but there's still a lot of them. I picked like three of the most notable ones. Davros is the face commander. It works very well with artifact creatures, specifically Daleks. Uh, Cult of Scaro is kind of like the most uh, generic of the bunch. It doesn't really cares about any particular types, it just wants to be attacking. And then the Veil Yard, if you want to focus on uh, voting and villainous choicing, then that's, that's the best option there too. In terms of deck price, it's on the high end. Uh, we got the first ever snuff out reprint that is notable, I think, in many, many years, uh, which is very cool. Uh, we have a new card that a lot of different artifact creature decks care about, like Cyberman Squadron, uh, and really good reprints with Lightning Greaves and Propaganda. The stock list is uh, uh, bad. It's not good. It's trying to do a lot of different things. Um, there are uh, Artifact Creatures Matters as a sub-theme, um, Cybermen as a sub-theme, Daleks as a sub-theme, Villainous Choice as a sub-theme, and it doesn't really mesh well together, and it really depends on what you're drawing, whether or not you're gonna have a good time or not, because it's very inconsistent. It's trying to do way too many things all at once, and it's kind of, it fails uh, overall due to trying to do all those things. So I'm going to give the stock list actually a C. It's just not very good. In terms of upgrade potential, if you want to make it into like an artifact deck, then there is some hope for it. Otherwise, like if you want to focus on like villain's choice and stuff, there's just nothing to add really. There's a little bit of voting matters stuff that you can be adding to the deck, but not really. So I don't know. Maybe this is a C as well too. I just, I just, it requires such a massive overhaul for it to be good, to be worth it. And then for uniqueness, like if it's an artifact creature deck, we've seen that before. If you want to focus on villain's choice, then that's brand new. It's like a new voting deck thingy. Uh, and then it has all unique art, which is always, always a plus one in my book. I will give this one a B. B in uniqueness. So two C's and a B. So yeah, with seven points, I just, I'm not a fan of, of the Masters of Evil. Like, yeah, it, it could do kind of well sometimes, but it's very inconsistent. It's kind of a mess and upgrading it, I just think you would just be much better upgrading from scratch, like build a deck from scratch instead. So that's a disappointing D. All right, the final Doctor Who precon is Blast from the Past. This is Bant Historic Matters, basically. It's Bant. Historic Matters, so legendary cards and stuff and artifacts and whatnot and sagas. Um, but it also has a token sub theme going on as well, too. So as usual, there are a lot of different doctors and doctors companion in this one. Uh, I just put the face commanders over here because they do the best job in terms of explaining what the deck is all about. And I think they are, are overall the best choices for the deck. Uh, the fourth doctor carries about historic stuff on top of your library. And then you get to uh, basically do card advantage and make a food token and artifacts are historic. So that's cool. And it's a token stuff. And then Sarah Jane Smith, um, allows you to investigate making more tokens uh, whenever you're doing historic spell stuff. So historic matters, tokens matters. That's that's the name of the game here. And these two do it very well, actually. I would say they're one of the stronger face commanders that we've seen so far. In terms of deck price, it's also mid to high. Uh, we have a very fun new card with displaced dinosaurs. It's a dinosaur, that's why it's so expensive, but it works much better in like historic decks or whatever, or just like anything that makes like artifact tokens really, like clues or whatnot. You can turn them to some, some diners, it's amazing. Um, City of Death, I, a lot of token decks absolutely love this because you have a lot of chapters of just copying your best token every single turn, that's awesome. And we have reprints like Heroic Intervention and Three Visits who are both staples to the format, that's all well and good. And the stock list, I will say, is actually the best out of the Doctor Who ones that I've seen so far. Not amazing overall, but still the best of the bunch, I would say. It has a very, very strong Historic Matters sub-theme, very cohesive, very tight. And it does also have that token sub-theme going on as well too, and a lot of cards that merge the two together. However, a lot of the cards showing up here, while some of them are good, a lot of them are very bad, like the Curse of Fenric. It's just like a mess. Um, and yeah, it's just a lot of the cards are overcosted. Like the Sixth Doctor is really cool, but is it six mana cool? I don't think so. Um, so 
there's there's problems here. It's it's inconsistent. Uh, a lot of the cards are on the weaker end. So I will say overall the stock list is a B. Now the upgrade potential is an easy A. Historic Matters is a very well supported archetype at this point in Commander and just keeps getting more and more historic over time as we keep in getting more and more legendary permanents. Like the more legendary permanents, the better historic becomes. And also token support stuff, we have a diamond dozen of those these days. Um, so yeah, you could just definitely take out all the bad cards from Doctor Who and, and add in all the better ones, the Historic Matters cards as well. Um, so that's an easy A. In terms of uniqueness, I'm also going to give it an A. I believe it's the first ever Historic Matters Commander, um, pre-con at least. And I could be wrong there, but that, that's off the top of my head. And again, it's all new art, uh, all Doctor Who in-universe art and flavor text. So that's a very unique selling point to it as well, too. So two Bs and an A. I will say that this Doctor Who deck is the best of the bunch, in my opinion. Uh, most powerful, best overall made. So I'm going to put it as a high B. All right, we get to the final four with the Lost Caverns of Ixalan Commanders. And we're starting things off with the Pirate deck. This is Ahoy Mates. This is Grixis Pirates Matter. It's all about pirates. Every single creature in this deck is a pirate. And it has a little bit of a graveyard sub-theme, a little bit of a treasure sub-theme, a little bit of a stealing sub-theme, a little bit of everything. Pirates are dabbling everywhere, you know? Um, so the commander options here, the most notable ones are, I think all three of them actually, Admiral Brass is the face commander, it's brand new, and it cares about pirates, but it cares about reanimating pirates, so it has a graveyard theme to it. Admiral Beckett Brass is uh, a reprint, it also cares about pirates, um, but it cares about dealing combat damage and stealing stuff. And then the other pirate is Don Andreas the Renegade. It only cares about pirates in regards to if you're stealing stuff that are creatures, then those creatures are now pirates, but it's the theft commander of the deck. The deck price is mint to high, it's $72. Uh, the biggest reprint is Black Market Connections, uh, which is, I personally think, is a staple in Commander decks. It just is a way better Phyrexian Arena. Broadsword Bombardiers is very expensive, mostly because of Legacy Plague, I believe. Like, it, like the boast mechanic is very good with grief and whatnot, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. And then we have really big reprints. I'm really happy to see Pillar's Plunderer finally reprinted. It's a very expensive uncommon and a great pirate. And then Harold's Home, like the generic. Uh, the stock list is very disappointing in my opinion. I count tw uh, 35 pirates, which is uh, a lot of them, and 12 pirate payoff cards, which those numbers sound great, right? However, the problem is that there's no direction to any of these pirates. Like some of them explore like Francisco, which kind of works with the graveyard theme. Some of them make you treasure like Malcolm and have payoffs to treasures like Gem Cutter Buccaneer. And like, sure, you could just use the tre treasures generically to uh, accelerate, mana accelerate and stuff. And that's great too. We have some theft stuff going on with like Coercive Recruiter and uh, cat, uh, stealing stuff from people's libraries as well too. But like... What's what's the bottom line with these pirates? They're all just doing different things. What is what is the driving force? What's the main theme of the deck? There is none really. <laughs> There's just none. So in regards to the theme and how it plays out, the deck is very inconsistent. Like sometimes you'll have a good draw of good pirates, but there's like a lot of like mediocre pirates here too. And there's a lot of things that you want to be doing graveyard stuff, but you have no graveyard enablers. You have treasure stuff, but you have no treasure enablers. You have theft stuff, but you don't have the right theft enablers. And it's just kind of a mess. So I'm actually giving the stock list a C. In terms of upgrade potential, I'm also going to give it a B. It's a higher rank because there are a lot of decent pirates to be adding and there's a lot of pirate support cards to be adding, but you really have to pick a theme you want to be going for. Do you want to be going for graveyard stuff? The, the commander is a graveyard commander, so if you're running stuff like Malcolm Alluring Scoundrel or Brass's Tunnel Grinder, you can put stuff into the graveyard to reanimate them and then you're working towards that main theme. That's well and good. And then you have generic pirate stuff depending on whatever you want to be doing, like Roaming Throne and forerun in the coalition they're just going to be great in any deck basically um so yeah it's a b in terms of upgrade potential but you really have to like gut a lot of the pirates in the pirate deck to basically focus your deck onto one main theme and that's that's why i'm lowering the rank on it it's not that there's not a lot of good cards to add it's that 
the stock list isn't helping you in terms of focusing on a theme and you have to make a lot of cuts to make that actually work. In terms of uniqueness though, this is an A. This is the first ever pirate precon. I thought when we went to uh, Ixalan the first time that we had commander decks for all of them, but I, I checked and nope. So this is actually the first pirate uh, precon ever, ever made. So it's an A. So with a C, an A, and a B, I'm gonna be putting the pirates in C category, yar. Next in Lost Caverns of Ixalan, we got the Merfolk deck with Explorers of the Deep. And this is straight up a Merfolk deck. There is a little bit of an Explorer sub-theme, not too much though, but it's all about basically just casting a bunch of Merfolk, pumping them up with Merfolk Lords, and smashing face with them. The two commanders for the deck are Hakbal of the Surging Soul. This is a new commander, and it's the face commander, and it's all about having a bunch of Merfolk on the battlefield and exploring a whole bunch, and then ramping a little bit when you get to attack. And then there's also Kumena, Tyrant of Araska, which is also a Merfolk commander. It cares about Merfolk. It wants to tap them to draw cards or putting plus one, plus one counters on stuff too. Um, so there's a little bit of overlap in terms of plus one, plus one counters because Hakbal puts counters on stuff and Kumena puts uh, counters on stuff. Both of them kind of draw cards in their own way too. Uh, but Kumena is mostly about tapping and untapping and Hakbal is mostly about just having a lot of Merfolk on the battlefield and sometimes attacking. In terms of deck price, it's again mid, um, $67. Uh, there's a lot of really good reprints here. Uh, Branching Evolution and Kindred Discovering be the most notable ones. Uh, there's new cards that are really good, like Ripples of Potential, which is just very good in any sort of counter deck, and like Metallic Mimic, which is really good with uh, plus one, plus one counters and certain creature types like Merfolk. And the stock list is really good. I count 35 Merfolk, six cards that care about Merfolk, and 24 cards that care about plus one, plus one counters. And there's a lot of good reprints. And also, the face commander is very strong. Strong. Hakbal is very strong. Um, there's really not a lot of Explore Matters cards in the deck. I, there's literally two. There's only two, but the two are very good. Like Topography Tracker is just very fantastic if you ever get to see it in your in your deck in your game. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I was very impressed by the stock list here. It's an easy A. And then in terms of upgrade potential, it's also an easy A. Like there is some amount of merfolk out there to still be adding, but you can really uh, dive deep into like the explore part of the deck and plus one plus one counters as well too. There's so many plus one plus one counter support cards in here. There's so many ways of uh, really abusing the explore mechanic. Like you're gonna be putting a lot of lands into your hand, so you might as well dump them out more efficiently with like burgeoning and Oracle of Moldaya. And yeah, there's also just really good Merfolk that you can be adding as well too, like Forerunner of the Heralds and Vodalian Hexcatcher. So easy A here. And this is the first ever Merfolk deck. So this is also an easy A in uniqueness. So easy A's all around. Easy A's all around. Merfolk go directly into the A category. Next, we move on to Blood Rite, which is the Orzov Vampire deck. It's Orzov, it's vampires, and it has a strong focus on aristocrats with a little bit of a life game theme as well. So the commander options here that are the best, in my opinion, Clavelenio is the face commander. It's about vampires specifically and about sacrificing them for extra value. Then we have Alenda the Dark Dusk Rose. It's a vampire. It doesn't care about vampires though, but it does care about aristocrats. So it focuses on the aristocrats. And, and same thing with Carmen. Carmen, I think is actually the strongest of the bunch, but she doesn't care about vampires. And to really get her value, you want to basically ditch the vampire theme, focus on uh, more efficient ways of triggering Carmen and everything, and then she becomes really, really good. Uh, so I would say for the stock list, Clavelanio just makes the most sense because this is a vampire aristocrat deck, and Clavelanio is the only one that cares about vampire aristocrats. It's not the strongest of the bunch. I think Carmen, and you could make an uh, argument Alenda are better, but I think Clavelanio is the best if you're focusing on the stock list at the very least. Deck price is mid-high, uh, $79. Uh, Exquisite Blood, first ever freaking reprint that isn't outside that is outside of Jumpstart, so that's a momentous occasion. Uh, then there's a new re, uh, new card, Charisma Conqueror, which is a card that I hate, but is nonetheless very very powerful um, and good reprints like Blood Gas. So yeah, a lot of value here. Um, and then the stock list is very good. I'm gonna give it an A because uh, the vampire cards that they added are just very powerful and very good. And a lot of the ones that I was hoping to show up here are actually here. Um, so it focuses on the aristocrat theme and a little bit on the, uh, the drain gain life theme. Uh, like Oso and Vampire, great sack fodder, but you need to be gaining life. Blood Artist, uh, great sack payoff, you're gaining life. 
Um, and then other like sack payoffs like Cordial Vampire to go wide. Indulgent Aristocrat is vampire support, but also a sack outlet as well too. All, all good stuff. A yeah, really good thing, A. I think the commander is probably the weakest part of the deck, honestly. Clavelino is definitely weaker than Hackball and the other ones uh, that are leading decks in Lost Caverns of Ixon. But the 99 kind of makes up the, the, the parts that he's lacking, and he's not terrible, honestly. Uh, the upgrade potential, though, is very high, too. Uh, vampires are one of the best supported uh, creature types in Magic. Uh, there's a lot of cards you can be adding here, and there's a lot of aristocrat stuff and life gain stuff you can be adding here. So like Vito and Pond of Ulamog, those work very well with like aristocrats in general and vampires in general. Uh, whereas if you keep focusing on life gain aspect, which kind of dovetails nicely with aristocrats, Amalia becomes really good. Vain Witch Coven works very, very well too. So easy A there too. And then in terms of uniqueness, well, that's where it takes a hit because this is not the first vampire precon we've seen. The first one is obviously the Edgar Markov uh, Mardu deck. And Edgar Markov is a better vampire leader, let's just be honest here. But I think Clavelania is a little more interesting, deals with aristocrats. Nonetheless, though, uh, not, we're, we're not competing between the two, but we're just saying that in terms of uniqueness, uh, despite it having an aristocrat and life gain sub theme, it's not the most unique uh, precon out there. It's a B. It's not an A, it's a B. So with two A's and a B, I'm putting Clavelenio's Blood Rites over at top of the B. And then the final new commander from 2023, rounding out Last Caverns of Ixlan, it's Veloci Ramp Tour. This is Naya Dinosaurs. It's all about casting dinosaurs, buffing your dinosaurs, and attacking for big, big damage. And it has a little bit of a sub theme with Enrage, where certain dinosaurs, if they take damage, they give you something beneficial as well. Um, so, in terms of commanders, there is Pentlaza, Sun Favored, which is a dinosaur, which extra marks there and it just adds extra value to all your dinosaurs as soon as your dinosaurs enter the battlefield you get to discover x so you're getting card advantage and mana advantage every single time you're just doing your thing and if you upgrade it it works very well with blinking and then there's waita trainer prodigy which my personal favorite of the two honestly yes it's less high value or anything but it kind of enables the uh dinosaurs enrage sub theme and i love in rage and she does that while also acting as like a removal uh source by fighting your creatures against your opponent's creatures as well too um they're both really really good though i i'm bantless is obviously more popular and more straightforward but i personally just like waita but they're both ace they're both ace for me and pantlaza also has cdh potential by the way so that's awesome too um the deck price is on the high end it's a hundred dollars which is notably higher than the other ones because people love dinosaurs People freaking love dinosaurs. So all of the dinosaurs are kind of on the higher end. Uh, Akuma's Will is the biggest, most notable reprint. It's $13. It's a commander staple. It's one of the best finishers in the entire format. Apex Altasaur is a nice top end for dinosaur decks. Uh, Chandra's Ignition is a nice board wipe. It also enables Enrage and everything. That's good too. Um, the stock list is very, very good. Very, very good. It runs all the, the, van the, the dinosaurs you expect them to run. Um, it has a good curve. It has a lot of really good ramp. Uh, it's just a nice cohesive deck. Uh, so it has dinosaurs, it has dinosaur payoff cards, and it has that enraged sub theme and it all works out really, really well. Easy A. The upgrade potential is also very good. Despite dinosaurs being a relatively new creature type and not having that much support, just basically this and Blast Ixalan, that's basically it. <laughs> There's a lot of still really good uh, dinosaurs you can be adding. If you are going for Paint Laza, you can also add a Blink sub theme to it, which is very, very uh, powerful, like Ephemerate. You can like play a dinosaur on your turn and you can trigger a Paint Laza and discover. And then on your uh, on an opponent's turn, you can Ephemerate your Paint Laza or your biggest dinosaur or whatever to discover again for one mana. Also while protecting your creatures from target removal, which is incredibly powerful. And then it rebounds and it gets to do it again for free as well too. Um, then there's also really powerful dinosaurs. If you like generic dinosaurs, like Kogla and Yadaro, but if you're an enlightened person like me and love your enrage, there are also uh, enrage uh, dinosaurs and enrage payoff cards like Silverclad, Ferocidons, and Forerunner of the Empire to um, make your enrage dinosaurs even better, uh, which I personally love. So easy A there for upgrade potential as well too. 
And then in terms of uniqueness, also an A because it's the first ever dinosaur pre-con deck. I thought there was another one before in Ixlon. There wasn't. Um, so yeah, this is the first ever dinosaur commander pre-con deck. So easy A. A's all around. So because it's A's all around, we put it easily in the A category. And I'm going to put it at the very beginning. Uh, this one is very impressive. And it's another type of deck that you can take it to your commander night. And if it's casual, it's like mid power, low power, it's going to do very, very well. And it has the potential to be much, much stronger if you upgrade it as well, too. So that's it for the tier list for 2023. I hope this helps you uh, determine which precons you want to be picking up. Um, again, my ranking criteria might not be as useful to you as other people's ranking criteria. I don't know if, for example, you care about uniqueness. Let me know what you think of the criteria in the comment section below so I can improve things in the future if there's other things you would want weighed in when determining what's the best and worst precons of the year. But yeah, that said, everybody, thank you so much for reaching the end. It was a long video, so I really appreciate you all sticking it out all the way to the end here. Like and subscribe if you like that sort of stuff. And I'll see you all in 2024. So have a happy new year. Enjoy celebrating. Take some time off. And until then, friends, see ya.